morning, everybody. My name is Jordan Likeness, and welcome to our digital dialogue series. I am the Canada Program Manager for the Friedrich Ebert Stiftung, and we're a nonprofit German political foundation that works in over 100 countries to promote democracy, freedom, and equality. And today's program is part of our Washington DC based transatlantic dialogue where we're bringing together progressives and social democrats from all around the world to talk about some of the pressing issues that are facing us during the COVID crisis. Uh, today's event is based in Ottawa, Canada. So I'd like to acknowledge that it's taking place on the traditional unceded territory of the Algonquin Anishinaabe. And I'm really pleased to have with us today three fantastic guests to delve into the issue of gender and COVID in Canada. So we have here with us today, Lindsay Matheson, who is the New Democratic Party critic for women and gender equality, as well as the Member of Parliament for London Fanshawe. We have Vicki Smallman, who is the Director of Women and Human Rights for the Canadian Labour Congress. And we have Catherine Scott, who is the Senior Economist with Canadian Centre for Policy Alternative and who heads up their gender programming. So we're going to have a great discussion today. Uh, we're going to look very, uh, you know, in great detail about how women are being impacted by this crisis in Canada. And then we're going to have an opportunity to talk about what rebuilding needs to look like if we're going to rebuild for more equality. And we just have a couple of housekeeping things before we get going. So this session is going to be recorded. So if uh, for any reason you need to duck out, don't worry, you'll be able to catch the rest of it later on. And we're going to start off with a little bit of a brief presentation from each panelist, and then we're going to have time for Q&A. So you'll see on the bottom of your screen there a little Q&A bubble. Please feel free to pop questions in there at any point during the discussion, and we'll get, uh, we'll get through answering those towards the end. And so with that, I'd like to start by turning it over to Catherine to talk a little bit and give us an overview of what the economic impact of the COVID crisis has been on women in Canada. Thanks so much, Jordan. It's a real pleasure to be here. I'm um, <clears throat> very, just uh, really thrilled to have this chance to talk to your, uh, this community and the, um, about uh, the impact of COVID on that's having, particularly on women in the labor market. I'm going to call concentrate my comments on women in work in Canada and to sort of outline um, how this pandemic has been uh, un unfolding in Canada, and what we're looking at down the road and what are some of the critical issues we're turning to as we try to chart a just gender just recovery. I'm going to, I have a few slides that I'm happy to share with folks after the, um, after the session and I'm going to try to share my screen right now and if it uh, if, uh, works, hopefully it'll go quite smoothly. So let's see. All right. Excellent. So, <clears throat> all right. Nope. Hang on. Hmm. Oh, there we go. Sorry. So, uh, the May job report came out, I guess, in a couple of weeks now, and it hinted at a recovery that was starting to take hold in Canada. But it's feared, certainly by economists and uh, folks in the nonprofit sector and the labor movement and the like, that really what we were starting to see was a recovery among in male employment, and that women were actually lagging men to a considerable degree by in terms of job creation by a factor of two to one. So women only accounted for 29% of the recovery of um, COVID-related job losses and absences posted in May. And again, this was to be expected. This really modest uptick in women's employment um, was disappointing. So cumulatively, we now stand at uh, cumulative job losses among women of around 1.5 million. And another 1.2 million women have lost the majority of hours of their employment. These losses are impacting over a quarter of the entire female labor force. So that's 28%, and this touches industrial sectors across the economy. And of course, as this chart shows, these uh, job losses obviously are concentrated much more acutely in service industries and like elsewhere in the world, women in Canada have been disproportionately impacted in, in sectors like food and accommodation, in retail, but even in sectors where they are uh, less represented, manufacturing and the like, women have disproportionately suffered the job losses and are now lagging. It will be critical to see how this unfolds. 
uh, in the months going forward. There we go. Um, in the in it is also true uh, that there was um, a boost in employment in, low wa in the low wage sector, but mainly among men. And that overall, low wage workers in Canada, and again, this is true elsewhere, have disproportionately borne the impacts of this, of this uh, recession. And this is really a distinctive feature of the, of, uh, this, you know, of the unfolding, the impact of COVID, certainly how, as it's impacted the Canadian labor market. You can see here that over 15, this is of May, in fact, the losses were even more steep, obviously, at the height of the loss in April, at the end of April, but over half of all women in the lowest earning bracket lost their jobs. That's over 55% of the next. So all workers under $16 an hour, over half lost their employment or the majority of their hours in Canada. Very steep income losses and obviously predictably tied. So those that are privileged and in higher income earning brackets here, as you see, in fact, men overall posted a 6% increase in their employment in the top earning bracket of over $48 an hour. So very skewed development. And this represents, of course, a disproportionate impact on workers in contract employment, precarious employment, those with part-time and the like. So this has been, you know, it's something certainly uh, very significant. And it's important to note in the Canadian context that this overwhelmingly represents other people like indigenous people, racialized people, those with precarious immigration status, undocumented migrant workers, people with disabilities. Again, they're the groups, these are the groups that are um, very much uh, at the heart of the pandemic, pandemic, yeah, pandemic and um, suffering the largest cuts. The other thing I wanted to touch on in my five minutes was how this is unfolding for women and, and in particular moms with kids under 12 and, and those with kids under six. Certainly in Canada, um, the, the, in total as of May, over 900,000, that's extraordinary, 900,000 parents with kids under 12 had lost their jobs or 50% of their hours. And mo mothers of this group, uh, mothers um, account for well over half of these losses and only 40% of the gains that were posted in May. And on this score, single parent moms are actually faring the worst and they've experienced, and in this chart shows you this, the, um, the uh, proportion of job loss of each of these groups and they're experiencing much more acute. So over, over a third of all single parents with kids under 12 experience job loss or hours loss as compared to mothers in two parent families. And really, you know, this, it's an this is a story that really has not grabbed the attention in the, in Canada and something we could hopefully talk about in the or in our session or um, in the commentary afterwards you know the the idea that you know we've got these you know hundreds of thousands of single parents and other parents at home wondering how they'll possibly go back to work um, in the absence of any kind of coherent or safe plan for reopening schools and child cares in Canada we know from recent surveys that actually over a third of childcare centers have already announced that they probably will close and or um, we're certainly uncertain that they don't have the support. Um, it's quite a precarious situation. And really in terms of the labor market, we are looking at um, potentially a rollback on gender equality, certainly economic gender equality um, that it, it has profound consequences going forward. Um, I just want to finish with this particular um, uh, chart and to say that we're already starting to see a widening of the employment rate among men and women. This is among all, all workers, obviously 15 and older, but some more acute among those between 25 and 54 that we really at this point we, with the uptick in male employment, um, we're looking at a group of women who have already left the labor market are no longer active or no longer seeking because of caring responsibilities easy for young children. And of course, we have a seniors crisis in Canada as well. But this going forward is something really important to look at. This will imperil women's economic security um, in the near future. And whereas in the past, women, of course, flooded into the service sector in past recessions, you know, that's not going to play out this time. And the crisis in our child care sector, in our elder care sector, really do uh, constitute extraordinary challenge for Canada that we've been fumbling to date. Um, it's been, uh, uh, it's not, it's fair to say that, uh, you know, we're on, this has been um, a huge pressing public policy challenge that governments and particularly provincial governments have not been stepping up to, to, up to the task. So I'll leave it there um, and uh, pass over to Lindsay and uh, Vicki.
Thanks very much, Catherine. So Lindsay, we'll turn it over to you. You know, these are some really sobering numbers I think that Catherine's walked us through. Could you talk a little bit about how in your conversations with Canadians, how this is really playing out for people on the ground? Uh, yes, certainly. <sighs> my office has been bombarded my constituency office um, with exactly what Catherine was talking about um, uh, people who um, are suffering a great deal because um, of this of this health emergency and i think that covid 19 has has really just exposed all the cracks that exist uh, in our system and it is really just highlighted the the millions of canadians uh, that were struggling before the pandemic even began um, and these, of course, are people, they don't have access to health or drug benefits. They don't have the job security. They don't have pensions. They struggle on low wages to, to pay their, their, their rent and their bills. They have precarious jobs and unsafe workplaces that they fear returning to um, because the majority of them are deemed essential workers, but they don't have paid sick leave. They don't have those, those things. Um, that would help them to, to go back to work safely. They often can't work from home. Um, and of course, the majority of those people are, are women. They're working in, in the, the five C's, right? The clerical, caring, uh, cleaning, catering, and cashiering, I believe are the, uh, are those. So uh, when these women, they, they, they're approaching my office, they're certainly uh, coming to us through women's organizations and they, they face incredible barriers that have existed generation after generation, government after government. And what I've seen ultimately is, is just that there's this status quo that, that desperately needs to be challenged and changed. And I think that we're at a, a crossroads in terms of how we decide to go forward. So do we, d does the, the electorate sort of turn towards that right wing conservative austerity measures, severe uh, massive cuts that ultimately I believe will prolong their suffering? Or will we turn towards um, another direction in, in changing that status quo and putting a lot of our, our economic power and investments back into social programs that we know people can rely upon and that will help people universally? One of the things that um, the NDP were really pushing for was when the government came forward with the uh, Canadian emergency uh, response benefit um, to to help those who had suddenly lost their job. Uh, we pushed for it to be universal uh, for a very specific reason in that no one needed to be left behind. But unfortunately, the government came forward with a series of complicated programs, while good to some degree, have again left a lot of people falling through those cracks. And And they design like so many social programs when less, um, more centrist or right-wing governments will, will create something like that or, or take away, they, they will create them so that they're harder to access for everyone. And a, a majority of people are fearful of um, not meeting all the criteria, not being eligible, and, and that the government will be um, punitive upon them. And actually we've seen that now where the government is moving that way. They wanted to introduce legislation that would penalize people who were claiming that benefit and they weren't supposed to be, um, ensuring that the Canadians were jumping through hoops that they didn't, um, that they didn't really need to do. It was unnecessary. Um, one of the, the things too, and I know that, that Vicky will, will go into this as well, and Catherine briefly touched on it, but it is, of course, about women in the workplace. We're not paid equally, and those levels of unpaid work continue to go unrecognized because they are done by women. There's old, tired views of what constitutes work. It's enshrined by laws and regulations that are, that are old and outdated, and, and that is part of that status quo that desperately needs to change. Um, a large part of the work that I also do is, is liaising um, with uh, women's organizations um, and uh, about the supports that they need, about the programs that they're providing. And we've had government after government um, fall into very short-term thinking. They think to the next election cycle or the fiscal year, um, the next budget, and they limit long-term goals of these organizations and provide short-term project-based funding. 
uh, that's not that's not just the case for women's organizations. It's it's throughout the not for profit and uh, charitable sectors. Um, the short term model actually it started over 30 years ago. Cretchen's uh, Liberal government made uh, they wanted to get out of that funding of those social programs of of the charitable and not for profit sector. Um, and they downloaded so many of their federal responsibilities onto provincial and municipal governments. Um, and this short term funding uh, forces organizations to continually um, only address the symptomatic issues that women and marginalized Canadians face rather than actually addressing the real systemic issues that continue to hold them down. Uh, and these regressive models, they, they starve organizations. And, and now sadly because of COVID, the more that people need to rely upon these social programs and these, these organizations, these groups, these programs, um, the more that's being asked of them, the less these organizations are able to fundraise, get the money that they need and be able to shift because again, short-term project-based funding to shift to, to serve the needs of a, of a community that, that whose needs are changing. So we need a government that changes that, that challenges again that, that status quo and looks at far much longer um, goals, uh, provides core funding, reliable, consistent core funding that they don't have to worry so much about. So um, I think that that is what I'm pushing for, um, certainly in terms of that long-term social um, inclusionary based um, planning and funding. Thank so you very much, Lindsay. And, and I, I think that's really timely. You know, one of the things that we're seeing in the news today is that groups like the Y or Big Brothers and yes. Big Sisters are actually at risk of, of folding and closing now because of gaps in funding. So those service provision organizations we know are really critical for delivering services that a lot of marginalized women rely on. Vicki, I'd like to turn it over to you now. Would you be able to talk to us a little bit about how the crisis is impacting women workers and workers' rights? Sure, um, and I'll try not to, I'll try to build a little bit on what uh, Catherine has already uh, flagged and Lindsay as well. I mean, I think as a whole, the pandemic has exposed and exacerbated existing inequities um, and uh, there's a real, you can see, or if you're paying attention, that there's a need for a gender responsive approach to response, stimulus, and recovery, but this isn't happening in public policy. Um, it's, as Lindsay described, a rather haphazard stream of consciousness kind of process, uh, and there's no evidence that, um, despite the fact that the federal government has mandated gender-based analysis or an intersectional gender-based analysis of all of its policies, any cabinet decision is supposed to have um, uh, have received this sort of uh, this this analysis, uh, but there's no evidence that this is actually being applied to the to the response uh, efforts. Um, you heard that from the stats that, uh, about from Catherine about who's been hit. Uh, you know, women laid off, uh, what sectors and so on, and who these women um, are disproportionately racialized: young women, women with children, lone mothers, low wage workers informal workers, domestic workers, actually some of those aren't even counted in the stats, right, because they're completely off the books. Um, uh, you also, uh, I think, uh, heard from her that, uh, you know, women dominated sectors are the ones that are now on the front lines, right? They're the ones who have had to keep working uh, to keep us safe, to keep us fed, you know, uh, to ensure that people have the, their, the necessities they need to live in the midst of the shutdown. So the ones that are out there putting themselves at risk are largely women. Um, they are also quite often low wage workers, <laughs> precariously employed. Uh, they don't have a choice to, to stay home. They need the income uh, as well. And uh, although we talk about these heroes of the pandemic, these are the professions that are most undervalued, right? The ones that do not receive equal pay for work of equal value. Uh, and it really sort of reflects the need for robust pay equity uh, systems to be in place, uh, which is not the case in Canada, despite uh, what many uh, feel is happening. Um, proactive pay equity legislation is only uh, in an, a few um, uh, sectors or jurisdictions, and uh, even the federal uh, legislation has actually not come into force yet. There's no regulations. It's not like it's going to take years before that actually happens, um, and it's not going to actually 
uh, impact these workers as well because it needs to happen on the provincial and territorial level. You also are seeing playing out what the legacy of 20 years or more, a few decades of, um, of austerity policy making uh, in terms of the way that workers, uh, working conditions, wages and working conditions in a largely privatized care system um, is, is uh, or in the, in the case of the public sort of healthcare, underfunded and work is undervalued. Uh, you see that it has a direct impact on the quality of care, on the safety of workers and residents in the case of long-term care facilities, on the uh, sustainability of our child care system, which is really not much of a system uh, at all and is at really on the brink right now, um, uh, as we're hearing from the child care sector. So we see that the privatization, the fragmentation of our care economy uh, impacts not just workers but everybody and also our public safety. So that is an issue that really needs to be addressed. But to me the real untold story of this pandemic is the one um, that is playing out in the homes of uh, many uh, families with children right now. And that is that uh, you know there, that this assumption that women are just going to be there when things get tough, right, to pick up the slack. And uh, so schools and daycares shut down, what choice do families have, right? Um, and, uh, you know, women already do uh, the most of the unpaid work or a, a greater portion of unpaid care and domestic work in Canadian families. Uh, now that, um, that that second shift has not just doubled, right? It's like grown exponentially. So with daycare, with schools closed, daycares closed, camps shut down, recreational activities canceled, this means that women's caregiving burden is 24 seven. Whether or not we are working out of the home providing essential services, working remotely in the home, or trying to figure out how we're gonna get an income because we've lost our jobs, right? And the second shift is not just you know, it's yes, it's caring for kids who are bored and need something to do and shut down because they can't go to playgrounds. It's, you know, being educational assistants, supervising our, our kids distance learning. Uh, it's managing the stress and anxiety of all of our family members trying to keep us on an even keel, organizing household tasks, trying to figure out how to get groceries around physical distancing requirements. Um, you know, the ability to, to sort of manage that. This is a whole level of project management that now has to be taken on. Uh, it is uh, sanitizing and monitoring, you know, uh, our, our environment. It's monitoring potential exposure, which is getting more and more uh, complicated as things start to open up, right? Um, the mental load alone is crushing, right? Uh, and as is the reality that there is no, no respite, no relief, no break. Now, if you have a partner, uh, and some, you know, anecdotally, we're hearing that more men are starting to step up a little bit in terms of taking on their share. Uh, but it'll be would be really interesting to do a time use study right now. Uh, but for lone mothers, right, there's no respite whatsoever. And uh, and and if you take steps to actually get respite, that means you're putting your family and potentially other people at greater risk. So Oxfam came out with a survey uh, last week, which said that 71% of Canadian women surveyed reported experiencing high rates of anxiety and stress. Uh, you know, the conclusion is we are not doing very well, right? Whether we're working, not working, we're, it, you know, we are not doing well. And this is a bit of a crisis, right? And the reality that decision makers aren't talking about the unpaid care load that has now been foisted onto women, uh, or even thinking about it in light of the recovery uh, is, is, is really problematic, as is the, um, you know, the way that the discussions in the public about uh, the economic um, re recovery are happening. You know, when we hear about stimulus, all we're hearing about is the need for shovel-ready projects. And these are the jobs for the guys, right? It's your 1990s response to, to, to crisis. And this is not the response that we need, right? We need a response that puts the lives, the, the work um, and the health and, and well-being of women and families at the front. And, and that is not uh, happening 
in our public discussions right now, which is a, a huge problem. Uh, I'll leave it there and we'll see where we go from, uh, from um, in the discussion. Thank you so much, Vicki. I feel like I can hear women around the world giving you a round of applause for, <laughs> for that. Well, you know, when I, when I tweeted about this last week on, on Twitter, I put a bit of a thread up because this has been going around my mind a lot lately. And yes, it, because I do have two children, I am working in a camping trailer in my driveway right now. Like this is, this is how, what we have to do. And I don't know what I'm going to do in the fall when they go back to school. Um, so yeah, it's a bit personal. So I tweeted about it and the, it's gone like it's gone almost well as close to viral as maybe like a Canadian Twitter person can expect, right? Yeah. Yeah, I think it definitely resonates. So thank you very much. And so I'd like to move us now uh, briefly just to a discussion about rebuilding. So we've identified a lot of challenges that women in Canada are facing. A lot of these are systemic. A lot of these are building on inequities that have existed for a really long time here, but would you, each of you, and, and maybe we'll start with Lindsay, be able to talk a little bit about what your top policy recommendations, what, what would you be advocating for, for decision makers to be bearing in mind as we shift towards a recovery and a rebuilding? And I'll just also say, again, if people are having questions as we're going, make sure to put them in the Q&A box, okay? So Lindsay, over to you. Well, certainly in terms of uh, what I was sort of talking about before, it's, it's that reinvestment and, and belief that those universal social programs that I believe it's a responsibility for a government to provide need to be first and foremost uh, at, the, at the forefront. And as, as, people could, as people start to return to work slowly, um, they need to know that they can do that safely. They need to know, uh, women need to know that their children will be cared for safely. The elderly parents that they're responsible for um, will be taken care of um, and kept safe. So it's, it's about, in those instances, it's about a universal, affordable childcare program. Um, and again, this is one of the things that the government has downloaded onto provinces and have stepped away from. Um, Long-term care and home care. Again, something that the government has stepped away from. And uh, we can um, really push on this, and, and New Democrat has been pushing on this in terms of creating national standards, linking it to the Canada Health Act, which ensures that, again, it's universal and it's provided for no matter where you live and that there's equal access and so on. Um, really reinvesting and strengthening, expanding our healthcare system. So moving into pharmacare, which New Democrats have been pushing for for decades. Uh, in the last election, we saw quite a, a large response to the provision of dental care. Um, mental health care is huge. Um, ear and eye care, it's a, it's a whole body approach to the idea that um, no matter what you earn, that you have access to, to these services. Um, I think in addition, we need a shorter work week. We need, and, and moving into, we, we started to hear after the um, CERB, the, the emergency response was provided that people started to talk again about guaranteed annual income or basic income and, and that universal provision. And we know that the studies are there. We know that it makes sense. All the government, all the, the right wing governments say, oh, well, we can't afford it, but it, it moves it away from that, that status quo welfare system um, that excludes so many and that is so punitive and um, it, it opens things up so that people start to thrive instead of just surviving. Um, they, need, they need affordable housing. <laughs> this is huge. Um, when when you're, you're struggling as a single mother and you, you can't make ends meet and, and you're paying skyrocketing rent, um, having that roof over your head is, is one of the fundamentals and, and I believe that it's a human right. Um, so pushing for that. And, and just to say, I, I'm really hopeful, like I had said, I think that we're at a crossroads because people have, people have sacrificed so much to ensure that their loved ones are safe, their neighbors are safe, they, they've stayed home from work to ensure that perfect strangers are safe. And, and that caring for each other I think is something that we desperately need to build upon. So coming back to all those systems of care 
making them universal is is and and saying you 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 need to recognize that all those sacrifices can't be wasted so what do we what do we build towards and and how do we how do we take care of each other better thank you lindsay so Catherine, what would you be putting in the windows the top recommendations for rebuilding for equality in canada uh I think there are different sets of recommendations. I think we need a set of uh, obviously policy actions right now to get us through what is obviously an ongoing public health emergency. And we need to be using this moment to pivot to uh, envisioning a more just and equitable society. And in, uh, certainly my organization, Lindsay of the Canadian Labour Congress, are very involved in discussions about charting a different course for Canada and using this opportunity to put in place a social foundation, a social infrastructure that can sustain us and ensure future prosperity. In terms of priorities, it's, um, I'll go back and talk about uh, uh, the care economy must be a critical uh, place of prominence in this discussion and actually uh, that not includes childcare, obviously long-term care. I, th I think, and we haven't stressed this, Canada does have this distinction of having the highest rates of death in our long-term care facilities and of that number, and I will I hasten to add, the majority have been women and that is unique in among industrialized countries. It is a national shame and tragedy that this is unfolded and how many more people must die on the federal provincial altar and that's really uh, what we've been alluding to for your, uh, to the listeners that may not understand the politics of Canada in our federal system the lack of support and coordination between levels of government and even today there's a story in the Globe and Mail saying you know how we failed at our, our response you know Canada has faced a pandemic challenge in the past with SARS 20 years ago and had a long list of recommendations which would have consolidated public health support and messaging and the like and again we had a disparate 13 jurisdictions the response and people died as a result and so clearly uh, focusing in on uh, the, so the care economy and in particular on long-term care. Child care is critical in that piece and providing and building out the infrastructure and that requires funds that will not only expand and create safe because that's obviously the huge challenge right now is to create spaces that uh, you know we can ride out this wave but also to provide ongoing operating so we can hopefully mobilize women's economic uh, you know women can return to employment and using those funds also to improve the quality of that employment this is the pivot moment and you know that goes along with robust labor standards you know we've had I guess Vicky was really eloquent speaking to 20 years of austerity budgets and tax on labor and you know bringing in 10 days of paid sick leave a year making sure that you know obviously part-time workers and bringing up rates of pay looking at uh, raising minimum wage and living introducing living wage standards social you know social procurement all of these tools need to be part of the the um of the response what's been interesting is trying to bring that focus you know this is obviously where women are to where we want to be into the discussion of ongoing green new deal uh how do we locate these um uh the, these measures within the context of obviously the imperative to address in Canada, obviously, we have a long history and a very poor history of obviously uh, proactive action on climate change uh, or global warming. Um, and how do you do that? And it's been a very challenging conversation, but really the way forward must center both of these objectives. And, you know, I, I'll end with concluding that a focus on social infrastructure is the greenest um, <laughs> play we can make. Uh, and, uh, you know, we, I, it behooves us as progressives to really, this is the moment we can bring these different pieces together so that we can create thriving communities because um, with, you know, the lack of vision that's on, that's being demonstrated right now by all levels of government, despite, you know, Trudeau, anyway, you know, the words and actions, we really do, this is a moment to bring those visions together so that we can create uh, thriving communities. I think there. that's so well put, Catherine, and, and you know, particularly with respect to the Green New Deal, this is a discussion that's very much alive in Europe as well, and you know, there's been a lot of work done on that, and they've had to pull that back and really reassess it in the light of what's happening with COVID, and, and I think gender uh, should be an important component of that discussion as well. So Vicky, you have a magic wand. What are we doing? I wish I had a magic wand. I mean, I think in addition to, I, I do think that care needs to to be at the core of any discovery, I mean, or any recovery plan. Um, the Green New Deal, like a lot of those uh, types of visions that we've seen, even progressive ones, 
uh, they're like gender neutral. And this pandemic is not gender neutral, right? Austerity is not gender neutral either. If we're looking at responses to uh, this, we have to think about who is most impacted, right? And the, the, the recovery plans should put the needs of the most marginalized and the most vulnerable first. Women, but also in, in Canada, indigenous communities, racialized people. I mean, we haven't really talked about the intersectional aspects of this uh, uh, I, uh, as well. Um, and that also needs to be considered, uh, you know, as we kind of craft a response. I think, um, you know, there's great suggestions out there. And in fact, the labor movement for a long time in Canada and globally has been talking uh, for a minimum investment in the care economy of 1% of GDP. Uh, wouldn't it be great if we just started with that and then had a conversation about how to shift our approach to care, both unpaid and paid care work and the delivery of care services to the people that need care uh, to a different kind of model, maybe one that puts the right to care first and doesn't see these, uh, um, these important foundations of our communities as uh, like a social program or something that we need to put in place for other people. No, like these, is the, this is, these are the basic building blocks of a strong and resilient society. Right, and having these in place will benefit women, it will benefit people with disabilities, it will benefit families, um, and so on. But ultimately, this is just you know, this should be the price of having a strong and healthy economy, and that will help to build a more robust economy. Right, if we invest in good jobs in the care economy, uh, it'll improve the quality of care, it'll keep people safe, and uh, you know, it's better for gender equality overall. So, that's the kind of conversation I'd like to see. Can we start measuring the uh, impact of women's unpaid care labor? I mean, the reality is, is that our economy has for generations relied on the invisible unpaid care and domestic work of women, right? Powerful men become powerful men because women are doing the work to create, to make, to create the conditions that allow them to go to work, right? Um, powerful women become powerful women because they hire other women, largely racialized women, uh, low-wage women, domestic workers, to, to take some of the, to relieve some of the burden of unpaid care work. So we need to sort of, you know, rethink uh, how we value care. Uh, pay equity also, in terms of the formal uh, and uh, paid workforce, needs to, um, needs to be implemented in all jurisdictions. I haven't talked about violence and harassment. And I will say that, uh, you know, um, for those people who are working in essential services right now, the risks uh, of, of violence and harassment have just been exacerbated. Uh, and they already are in work in sectors that experience more violence and harassment than, than other sectors. So uh, ratifying ILO Convention C-190 and making sure it's implemented is also uh, high on our agenda. As for what we need to relieve uh, the stress on women right now in, a, in an environment where we're about to go back to work and we don't know what we're going to do with our kids, uh, I'm not sure yet what the answer is and I would love to hear some ideas. I've thought recently I sort of had a thought about, you know, maybe we need to be investing in municipalities, recreational facilities and programming so that if school isn't full time, that school age children have, uh, you know, things that they can do safe. Uh, programming that will improve their health and wellness, but also give parents a break because boy, oh boy, parents need a break right now, right? Mothers need a break um, most of all. And, uh, and so while we fix the big picture of things, let's also look at the, the now and the immediate and find some ways to give some people relief. I think that's such a huge point, Vicki. And, and actually, for anybody who's interested, the Federation of Canadian Municipalities is putting up some interesting work right now on municipal services in the time of COVID. So that, that's something maybe to, to check out. But yes, uh, as a parent, I also feel very much the need for a break <laughs> at some point soon. So I'm going to move us now to some questions. Um, and just with an eye to time, I think we'll, we'll keep this fairly brief. But the first question that I have is from Naomi. And Naomi was wondering if we could talk a little bit about what have we learned about the role of childcare in the pandemic? And I know everybody's touched on this a little bit, but specifically she's wanting to know what are the lessons that can be brought forward to policymakers coming out of this crisis about childcare? And what in particular is Ottawa's role? What is the federal government's role in Canada 
in childcare that um, that they need to be stepping into coming out of this. So maybe I'll, I know everybody's got some expertise on this. So I'll ask maybe Lindsay to start uh, briefly and and uh, talk a little bit about what we could be doing better there. Um, yeah. So I had uh, I did briefly touch on it, and and ultimately again it is about uh, really having the government uh, step back up to its federal responsibilities uh, in terms of, of ensuring that everybody has that equal access. Um, we, we have great examples of some provinces who, who can do affordable childcare far better. Um, and in fact, living in Ottawa for several years, I had um, friends who on one side of the, the border in, living in Quebec had, had I, think, I think at the time it was $7 a day childcare and people living on the Ottawa side who are paying 60. Um, and, and that inequality uh, is, is unbelievable. And, it, and for so many parents, it's like a second mortgage. So it's about ensuring that there are, again, those national standards, um, but putting into place um, laws and, um, and regulations about how that all occurs. And interestingly, um, I was I was speaking to uh, local childcare providers in my in my um, in my riding, and they were talking about again the the stifling of their ability to actually pay their their workers. Um, they had taken advantage of the Canadian emergency wage subsidy, but uh, then later on they found out that um, they were on the hook for the additional twenty five percent because they weren't allowed by the provincial government to, to use the money that they had in other projects, from other projects, they weren't allowed to use that money to pay their workers. And um, so now some of these smaller, I mean, they were medium organizations that were in the hole per month, $60,000. Mm -hmm. So that just, that just shuts them down. And, and it's an insurance that you don't do that. <laughs> Um, and that for the federal government, but all levels of government to step in and say and realize that you cannot, for the retention of workers, for the equality of those workers, a lot of those workers being women, um, that um, the stability of that work has to be there and, and, um, and the quality of that childcare and the affordability of that childcare is there. Thanks, Lindsay. And, and Catherine, I don't know if you would like to speak as well to what we need to be doing a bit differently on the childcare file. Well, everything. We need to be doing everything differently on the child care file. Uh, the uh, Canada has a very, um, we're, uh, I mean, tremendous uh, uh, child care advocacy movement that's been active for decades and have been very clear about laying out a national plan. And that includes a much more, as Lindsay's alluded to, a much more active role of the federal government. Federal government currently provides monies for child care through a set of bilateral agreements, which have no conditions attached, basically fungible monies that go to the province. It's God knows what they're doing with it. Uh, their plan now, though, is absolutely to establish national standards, to set out a national labor force strategy, that there must be a massively increased transfer from the federal government to create a national system, um, which directs money to providers, uh, to child care providers in the nonprofit municipal sector to expand licensed regulated child care with well-paid workers. Um, and so forth. Right now, it's precarious patchwork in every province, largely privatized, reliant on parent fees. They've just been shut down for, like, we're on the brink, and it really truly feels, I mean, we have policy directions that could could uh, fix this, like really long-standing policy directions, but it's like the entire country's playing, playing chicken. Like, it's like, how far can we push the nonprofit sector, the childcare sector, all these sectors, you know, I mean, it, it, to read today around the why, the why is Canada's largest nonprofit employment services, childcare services, all, and they have ancillary businesses that have basically bankrolled their nonprofit work. To read that they're on the brink, like they are, you know, that's extraordinary. And it's just like if they go down, everybody goes down. And childcare is a sector that's larger than oil, and not childcare, the nonprofit sector is larger than oil and gas in Canada. You know, we're playing chicken with the lives of millions of people. And it remains extraordinary to me that the federal government has not stepped up concretely on this file. And the provinces have been sitting on their hands waiting uh, for, you know, things with the exception notably of British Columbia, but waiting 
which has an NDP government, uh, for the cards to fall where they may and who's picking up the pieces. So yes, lots of things that concretely the federal government and national provincial governments can do on childcare and other policy files as well. Vicki, would you have anything to, to build on? Well, only to say that the lessons of this pandemic are the lessons that we already knew. And one is that there should be no profit motive in childcare delivery, right? That profit does not belong in childcare. It doesn't lead to quality care. And we have to remove that from our system uh, altogether. The other is that it takes money, <laughs> you know, to run quality childcare. And the money can't come from parents. Parents are already paying the, you know, um, uh, most of the costs of, of child care programs in, in Canada and and it's so unaffordable already to many people um, so we need a better approach and I just uh, put in the chat uh, a link to the child care sector's very solid plan for rebuilding um, and expanding our, our child care system so I would encourage everybody to get involved in supporting those efforts Yes, that's great. Thank you so much, Vicki, because that I think is really timely. And we've got a question here from Heather that I think touches exactly on that. So I'm going to punt it back to you, Vicki. Shouldn't employers also have an obligation to ensure that as part of doing business in Canada, they contribute towards a national universal affordable childcare program? I totally agree. They should do it in the form of paying some better, more taxes, <laughs> you know, that, that they, you know, that if we did not have this drive to cut taxes, especially corporate taxes in Canada, um, we wouldn't really be in this position, right? I mean, Canada has a revenue problem and, the re and it's been caused by, you know, decades of government policy that this idea that if you if, if corporations pay less, we'll somehow do better. Well, sorry, but equality doesn't trickle down in that way, right? Um, and so, and all it's done is starve the system and it's caused this crisis, right? I mean, it didn't cause the virus, but it certainly has exacerbated the impacts of this virus and the shutdown on our communities and on families. Um, so yeah, corporations do pay a role. And I mean, I think employers also have a role to play, not just in like, you know, supporting the our universal system and it would be great to have some employers on board with that um, but also we have uh, you know workplaces need to understand too um, that there when workers are able to balance work and family responsibilities they are actually more productive and and more attached to the workplace and so there are definitely things that employers can do as well in terms of supporting not just women but men and encouraging men to take a greater share of the caregiving by supporting them in in doing so absolutely that's uh yeah that's huge so we're, we're going to take one more question and and i think actually it's a great question to to wrap up with and it's a question from from barb byers uh it's great to see you barb thanks for coming and Barb is wondering, how are we going to ensure that women who've been left so far behind before the pandemic won't fall back again? And so she's saying, you know, we haven't talked a lot about women in the shadows, for example, domestic workers. How do we get the Canadian government to ratify, implement, and monitor ILO Convention 189 to ensure decent work for domestic workers? That would be an example of that. Um, and uh, we've also got another question here from Kimberly about tracking unpaid labor. How could we do that? What would um, what would be involved in that? So I'm going to I'm going to pass that back to everybody. How do we ensure that women don't slide back? And how do we get the government active on ratifying some of those conventions that are important in that in the workplace? And how do we track unpaid labor that women are doing? And then if you want to offer any concluding thoughts as we do that, that would be great. So I'm going to pass it back to Vicky to start. Thanks, Barb. And uh, you can always count on Barb to bring up Convention 189 because she was instrumental in helping to negotiate that. And it was actually a, a really important um, convention and has been for domestic workers around the world. Uh, I think in Canada, it is absolutely imperative that we ratify uh, C-189. To do that, we have to get all of the provinces and territories on board. Um, and, and there has to be political will, of course. Um, and that has really been lacking, I have to say, when it comes to this particular convention. In many jurisdictions in Canada, domestic workers are not actually considered workers. They're not covered by health and safety law um, or employment uh, standards and regulations. And that is a big problem, right? Changing that 
uh, would allow um, these workers to organize, to unionize, to advocate for their rights, to have recourse. Uh, right now, they do not have that in, in most jurisdictions. Um, and uh, and that would make a huge difference. So uh, yeah, ratifying C one eighty nine would be um, would be huge. And in terms of uh, women, I mean, I really think that if we don't have women um, and and you know women workers and care at the sort of as a sort of fundamental principle, not as an add on you know to another set of principles, but as the driving force behind the recovery planning, I think that we will continue to see gender equality slip away um, and in ways that we can't even imagine. Uh, I, I just feel like we are losing, we're on the brink of losing a generation of women and all of the gains that were made by our mothers. Uh, you know, I, it just, it's, it's heartbreaking, it really is. Yeah, I definitely feel that. I think that um, the intensity of this crisis has really uh, is it's been huge and, and continues to be so and maybe that doesn't always match the tone of the public policy debate. Catherine, um, so touching on how do we prevent women from sliding back? How can we measure unpaid labor? How do we do that? Um, I'm completely with Vicky on this about centering the needs and the voices, the experiences of uh, women and other in marginalized communities in our planning and uh, bringing that to the decision making table. In fact, there are very few voices. You look at the panels, the recovery panels, uh, these communities are not represented on those efforts. That's, that's true in the progressive community as well. Um, uh, in turn, certainly on the issue around domestic workers, and again, I agree, certainly agree with Vicky around the convention. Uh, there is certainly a good push within migrant workers' rights organizations to address immigration reform. In Canada, obviously, there's been historically privileging of economic migrants, and the, the push now to ensure that the huge number of migrant workers that are coming to our country to assist us in the agricultural sectors are paying with their lives for that to living in uh, terrible settings. In agricultural communities in southwestern Ontario, I know that's Lindsay's neck of the woods, uh, that we really must look at pathways to permanent residency for and uh, citizenship for this, this particular group of workers, including obviously those uh, who have been coming in to assist in the care economy. And as we've already alluded to, there's a huge number of women, uh, largely women who are coming from uh, the global south that sustain and support Canada's care economy. And it's a, it's a natural, and including working uh, undocumented in our nursing homes where, you know, laboring again, putting their lives on the line. And it's extraordinary that we have not really stepped up to the plate with actual meaningful immigration reform. That's obviously a critical plank in any recovery plan. Um, uh, yeah, sorry, just I'll leave it there, but that um, that would go a long way to equalizing and establishing, providing the rights and respect that that, that, that that group of workers need so they can enjoy access to employment, protections, income security programming and the like, which they currently don't enjoy. Thanks so much, Catherine. So Lindsay, turning it over to you for some final words. Uh, thank you. Yes, and I and I really appreciate the, uh, the FES having provided this today. Um, I put into the the chat um, the NDP's Building for Better link. Um, this is something that we we wanted to really move on. Um, start conversations about exactly this, this, what does the future look like? How are we going to make things better for, for everyone in Canada, for workers, for, for women, and, and so on? And actually, the next panel, um, they haven't set a date exactly yet, uh, but uh, the next panel will be on uh, the impact of COVID-19 on, on women in Canada. So, um, uh, and there's also a survey, but the idea was that um, we can't return back to the old normal because the old normal was broken. And, and so how do we move forward? And um, uh, a lot of conversations, we've already had one on, on the environment and, and Canada's place in the world and, and um, um, the healthcare sector was the first. So, so we're really starting to have those conversations and I encourage anybody to, to fill out the survey, put forward your thoughts, but also um, join in on those conversations as they happen uh, throughout the summer as well. Thank you so much. Um, and thank you really, Vicki, Catherine, Lindsay, this was great. There's so much to say. I feel like we could do another entire panel on all the things um, that we didn't even get to touch on. So. I'm hopeful that we can get you back and maybe do an update. 
Uh, yes, as Vicky is saying, we didn't even discuss violence against women, which is a huge topic and something that we're certainly seeing an increase uh, in here in Canada. So I'm going to have to invite everybody back so that we can continue the dialogue. I'd like to just make sure that everybody is taking a moment to check out the chat. There's some great resources that, that Vicky and Lindsay and Catherine have posted there. I've also put the FES DC's uh, Twitter handle in there. So please give us a follow. We're gonna be doing more dialogues, more discussions, um, keeping you up to date about what's happening here in Canada and putting us in conversation with our allies and our colleagues in Europe so that we can do this thing, this rebuilding better together. Um, it is a global challenge and I know that everybody um, wants to make sure that we're, we're combining our efforts as much as possible. So I'd really encourage you to keep that discussion going online. And thank you so much for being with us today. Again, really hope we'll see you back again and have a wonderful day. And thanks again, Vicki, Lindsay, Catherine. This was great. Take care, everybody. Stay safe.